everyone. It's Denise Brown from the Caregiving Years Training Academy. Thanks so much for being with me today. This is the third in a series around coping with healing from our caregiving fatigues. So every month for the past three months, I've been sharing some insights about a fatigue, a weariness that might happen during a personal caregiving experience or in any type of experience where you feel like you are taking care of others. And I came up with this idea that compassion fatigue is really an umbrella term. Probably about four years ago, I was talking to a participant in my training program for certified caregiving consultants. And she was talking about how her mom just couldn't cope anymore. And as I thought about it, I thought, Maybe it's just that there's too much to cope with and that we've run out of our coping reserves. In essence, when we experience loss after loss after loss, we can lose our resilience around coping. And that insight led me to think about what are the different fatigues that we experience throughout a caregiving experience. So I have a book out that has 12 of those fatigues and we've been going through those 12 every month. So this is our third month. Next month, we're gonna talk about discouragement fatigue. And we meet on the first Wednesday of every month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, so let's get started. And as I go through today's presentation, feel free to type in the chat room what kind of insights you have. And I'm going to ask a series of questions as well. So you're welcome to type your answers into the chat room. I suppose I should tell you a little bit about me before we get started. So I started helping and supporting those who care for a family member in 1990. And then I launched an online caregiving community in 1996 that I continued to manage and operate through last year. And I sold it last year to really focus on my training and development programs. I also helped my parents. My dad is going to be 90 in just a couple of weeks and my mom will be 87 in October. And I began helping my parents in 2004 after my dad's bladder cancer diagnosis. And I'm a little coped out. So I'm hoping to get a little resilience around coping from all of you as well today. Okay. The reality is, I think more now than ever, we are just in a perpetual state of coping. And it's coping with the news that's going on in the world, in our neighborhood. It's also coping with all the changes that we've experienced in how we work and how we interact with others and how we, we take care of each other within our family. So the, the, the coping is not only around coping with a personal caregiving experience, but it's also coping with all the changes that are going on in the world and our inability in many ways to find certainty. It seems like everything is uncertain. During a caregiving experience, the uncertainty is around the disease progression, what might come next, what tomorrow will bring. And now in our world, it's around COVID, and vaccinations, and what are the next impacts of, for instance, the variants. So we're coping, and then coping, and then coping. So no wonder we run out of the ability to cope. And I'm curious, I'd love for you guys to type in the chat room, to share in the chat room. How do you know when you've run out of coping resources? For you, how do you know that you are coped out? <laughs> and I feel kind of funny saying coped out because it sounds a little <laughs> like something else, but when you are coped out, how does it feel? So for me, I feel like everything 
is too much and I don't have enough patience. When I don't have the ability oh, to cope anymore, it's because it feels like I've run out of patience. And Christine is saying the same, very similar, getting short with others, right? It's this impatience. And another one is sharing, snapping at loved ones and wanting to be alone. That's exactly it. I feel like sometimes we just want to just go into a corner of our house, seal ourselves off and say, no more, no more. And I'm just going to ask you guys if everybody could mute themselves just because we're getting some background noise. So I'd love for you guys to mute yourselves. Thank you so much for that. Okay. And I also think it's exhausting, right? Pamela is talking about how tired she feels. Absolutely. Coping does take energy. And if we don't have the energy to continue coping, it's oftentimes because we are exhausted. And Anthony is sharing that he feels overwhelmed for a long period of time. Absolutely. It's this onslaught, right, of bad news. That's actually what we're coping with. And the bad news is around declines in our caries. And we use the term caree for whoever is receiving your care. So that's bad news, right? So the initial diagnosis is bad news. And then the impact of the disease process on our family members is bad news. And then the impact on us is bad news. So that would seem like enough, right? We have enough to cope with. And then you think about what you cope with when you leave your homes. And that is, you know, really trying to stay safe and be safe for yourself, for your families, family members, and for your community. And it's this idea of brain fog as well. So you just, again, can't think clearly because you've been thinking too much. And Lisa sharing, I have no tolerance. I just want to be by myself. Absolutely. We just say no more. I'm just going to take care of me. And I think when we are coped out too, we, have, we might have a tendency to have a little bit of a pity party for ourselves. And I think of a pity party as a short-term solution because it feels good to sit on the couch and have ice cream and watch Netflix and just say, the world can wait. I am just soothing my hurts right now. The challenge, of course, is our life isn't on the couch. So how do we get up from the couch and say, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to get out there and cope again. I have taken care of myself. Okay, so when I started really thinking about what can contribute to our coping fatigue, I think sometimes we might carry what isn't ours. So if we think about the weight of our lives, sometimes we have added a weight that is for another to carry. But because we are good, kind-hearted, compassionate people, we take it on and carry it ourselves. So how do we figure out what's ours to carry and what really is up to someone else to carry? So let's figure it out. What isn't yours? And as I pose some questions, I'd love for you to share some thoughts that you have in the chat room. So what isn't your problem to carry? This one has been a tough one for me for the past couple of days because I keep reading about the variants that are extending our pandemic. And it feels like, oh my gosh, what can I do? How can I solve this? It feels like this huge problem. And I remind myself of an insight I had when the pandemic started. And that is, what can I do within my world to ensure that I stay safe and that others stay safe as well? And that was putting on my mask. And something that I tried to do every time I put on my mask was say, a, a, a thought of gratitude for all the people out in the world taking care of us. So thank you to the healthcare professionals who are out there in the world taking care of us. So it felt like I understood there was a huge problem in the world. I understood that it wasn't necessarily something I could take on, but I determined what can I do in the world to make it better? And putting on a mask, 
and saying a note of gratitude was a way that I could feel like I was solving the problem. So I, I'm so grateful for what you guys are sharing in the chat room. And that is when another won't get help, I can't force that person to do it. We're actually going to talk about that in just a few minutes, Christine. Right. Absolutely. And then someone else is sharing the problem of whether or not someone else is vaccinated. And that is something that we struggle with because we want everybody to say, stay safe. And for those of you who are in the healthcare industry, we want you to be safe. We don't want you to feel that burden of being burnt out. So it is all about protecting ourselves, doing what we can, taking steps that we ourselves can control. I am vaccinated. I can control that. I wear a mask. I can control that. I also can think about, I can control how much of the news I read, I read too much of the news. And then sometimes I say, it's okay. <laughs> I don't have to be fully informed on all the latest breaking news 24 seven. I can take a break from it. It's okay. After 9-11, there was some research that was done around people that really stayed in touch with the breaking news, you know, watching that ticker on CNN with all the breaking news. And it was harder to cope if you were staying connected to that 24 seven news cycle. It was better to take a break. And that's what we can do too when we have all these problems that seem so big for us, especially a problem during a caregiving experience where we feel like we can't find the right help, we can't find enough help. And that is a huge problem. And so we start to think about it and think about it and almost become so attached to it, we can't let it go. And so this idea that we can take a break from our problems is a good way to take care of the problem. Okay, so what, is it, what isn't your problem to carry and how will you let it go? So Mary Beth is sharing detachment is key, meditation, prayer, breathing. And if I'm letting go a problem, because it's not mine to carry, I might have a good friend in a really tough situation. I'm doing all that I can to be a supportive listener, but it's their problem. I could actually spend time in a meditation, in a visualization where they are receiving what they need. And that's a way for me to let go of the problem. So I'm not wringing my hands and obsessing about it and allowing them to take care of it. So I'm letting go of the problem, but I'm also feeling like I'm a good friend because I am visualizing them receiving the solution that they need. And what I can do is visualize what is it like for them to receive that solution? I can picture them in my mind's eye, really feeling the gratitude of having a solution. So I can't take on their problem. I might not have the solution for their problem, but I can connect in my mind's eye with the visualization of them receiving that solution. And then it helps me with my own stress around their problem. So instead of worrying about it, I am visualizing that they receive the solution that takes care of their problem. That can be a way to let go. Some of you have talked about prayer as a way to let go. Absolutely. Prayer can be a wonderful way to say, this isn't my problem to carry. However, I am a committed, caring person. So I'm going to say a prayer for the problem. And that's a way I could let go of it while taking care of it. And Alyssa is saying that we can take time to do activities we enjoy. Absolutely. We never solve a problem if we give up our entire life, meaning that if you are focused only on the problem and don't take a break from it in order to do things that energize you and, and invigorate you and connect you to feeling loved, then it's hard to solve the problem because that's when you get coped out. So activities that you enjoy could be taking a walk, I like to swim in the mornings that connects me to the motion and that feels like 
in many ways a meditative activity. And it also takes me away from the problem. I can't fit the problem in the pool with me. <laughs> There's just enough room for me in my lane. So I swim and maybe I think about problems, but I often just think about, boy, this feels so good. And if I'm in the right headspace, something that I think to do is touch the wall and give great uh, gratitude, touch the wall and give thanks. That helps me as well. And we know that if you release a problem and do something that puts you into action, motion, it can help you actually think of a solution. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, this is a problem and I'm not sure what to do with it. I'll take a walk. And again, that movement changes something. And by the time I come back from a walk, I might think I know exactly what to do. In addition, I might come up with a good question to ask. I have a newsletter that comes out on Sundays and it's a question that really is an intention. And it's this idea that when we stay curious to our life, we can find what we need in maybe a less stressful way. So thinking of a good question to ask. So if it's a problem and it's not necessarily yours to carry, you could think of a good question to ask someone whose problem it belongs to. So for instance, maybe you have a friend that really can't change her life and seems to be really stuck in this circle of, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You've got to help me. You've got to help me. And you feel the pressure from your friend to fix her problem. A good question to ask would be, who could help you with that? It's not, I'll help you with that. It's who could help you with that? And that pivots her to think of, yeah, who could help me with that? <laughs> and then if she says, I was hoping you could, you could say, I wish I could. I'm not the right person to help you with that. Who could? So it's giving that problem back. It's letting go. So what isn't your problem to solve? So think about that one as well. So the first question was, what isn't your problem to carry? And then the second question is, what isn't your problem to solve? So think about a problem you've taken on that isn't yours to solve. And this is when we move into, how can you trust that another can solve the problem? This is a hard one for me with my parents. So they have physical limitations, but they are not cognitively impaired. And sometimes I have a tendency to swoop in and feel like I can solve this. And it does no good to them or to me if I'm always hovering with a solution. I do much better if I step back and give themselves the room to figure out how to solve this and to trust if they need ideas and suggestions around a solution, they will ask me for them. I wanna trust that they'll figure it out in a way that works for them. Otherwise, I am living their life and that's not up for me to do. <laughs> of course, the, the irony of all this is I always felt like my parents were living my life by always trying to tell me what to do, solving my problems in a way that I didn't feel actually were problems. So I want to make sure that I respect my parents and the way they want to live, regardless of how I feel about it, and give them the space to solve problems on their own and to trust that they will ask when they need help. So if you are taking on a problem that isn't yours to solve, how will you return it? So Liv is saying, yes, it's so hard when a parent has proven not to ask. That is so true. In my parent situation, they will ask if they are really struggling with the solution. And Liv, it is so hard when you're trying to juggle when to step in and when to step back. So what I try to do is offer, let me know when you need help. Sometimes I'll say, I can see this. What do you guys think about this? It might be questions that I ask in a way that starts a conversation. I'm concerned about this. I'm worried about this. 
What are you guys thinking? What will work for you guys? How can I support you? So sometimes it's trying to find the right, right way to open up the conversation about the problem and then continue the conversation so that everybody figures out a way to solve the problem. It is tough to live. I think that's the, the true challenge in caregiving when it's our parents. And that is they want to remain independent. We want them to remain safe. And how do you figure out the compromise so that there's independence and yet safety? And I have found with my parents that they are willing to sacrifice safety for independence. And that's hard. That's hard. And I go to my parents are able to make decisions for themselves. And so that's the default I go on. Of course, if you have a parent that is cognitively impaired, it does change that whole dynamic and that whole situation. Okay. So when it isn't your problem to solve, how will you return it? And it could be just that you decide to engage in a conversation around the problem in a different way. So many of you were sharing in the chat room earlier to detach. So if you have a friend that always wants to <laughs> give you the problem because they think, oh my gosh, you are so great at, at solving problems. You're so smart. You're so resilient. Here, take mine. You can just say, oh, wow, that's tough and not take it not take it. I used to host a national caregiving conference. I did it for four years. And what I found was people really wanted to give me their challenges in organizing the conference. And so it was a massive undertaking. And I thought I had enough on my plate. And then people would try to give me more. You know, it's this idea that, oh my gosh, I've got a monkey on my back. It's too heavy for me. I don't know what to do with it. I'm going to give it to you because you look so competent. And it's this idea that we don't have to take it. We don't have to take it. And we can just simply say, I have enough. I trust you to take care of that problem. I trust that you'll find the resources that can help you with that problem. Okay, what isn't your problem to worry about? This is a hard one. We actually did healing from worry fatigue two months ago. I think that was in May. Because the worries are hard to take care of. So something that I remind myself, every worry needs a plan. So if I'm worried about something, I put a plan in place to take care of that worry. Sometimes, though, I find myself worrying about problems that aren't mine to worry about. So if I think about all that I could worry about for myself, that's enough. I don't want to take on worries that aren't mine. So thinking about what's yours, what's a plan for your worries, and then what aren't the problems for you to worry about, and how can you release it? And again, it could be that you release it through prayer, you release it through visualization, you release it through good thoughts, you can release it. There are so many problems in the world that I think sometimes we get stuck in the trap of worrying about all the problems. And during the early months in the pandemic, my mom would remind me, we have brilliant, amazing people in our world that are working dil diligently to solve this problem. And that helped me release the worry about it. Because I would think you're right. We are blessed with amazing, really smart, committed individuals who want the world to be safe, who want the world to be well. I'm going to release this problem to them because they are the best people to resolve it, to come up with a solution, to take care of it. And then if I release a worry, I think about, well, how do I stay in a place of support? So again, it can go back to, I say a prayer for those people. I say a prayer for them when I put my mask on. Sometimes it's that habit stacking. If you have a habit, like the habit was putting the mask on and then adding another habit to it, like a prayer, a gratitude, a good thought. That can be a good way to release it. 
Okay, so what's the problem that steals your sleep? So I'm just curious, what wakes you guys up at night? Feel free to share in the chat room. I think this is a hard one because it's awful to wake up in the middle of the night with a problem because it makes the day that much harder. Yeah, children are, and their safety and their well being and their future is a problem that definitely can steal your sleep. Absolutely. And I think sometimes what happens is that it feels too big for us. We don't know how to control it. It feels out of our control. And it's the worry that wakes us up. And Deborah sharing, did I do enough? Yes, right. I think ultimately, that's the bottom line to the problems that wake us up. I have a business coach that talks about it's the worries around money and health that wake up us up at night. And I think I can go back to, did I save enough? <laughs> and did I exercise and eat well enough? And in caregiving, it's this idea of, have I done enough to keep them as well as possible? And it's caregiving for family members with an illness or a disability. And I also think it's caregiving around children. Have I given them enough? Have I been there enough for them? Have I given them enough of my time, enough of my love? Did I do enough? So let's think about how to take care of your sleep. Yes, could I've handled the situation better? Thank you for that in the chat room. Could I've handled the situation better? I think the regrets around our past are so hard because we can't go back and redo, it's already done. But if there's an opportunity for us to do differently in the future, that's the lesson learned of the past. So the question, could I have handled this situation better, could pose reflection, and then it could be, you know what, I probably could have done this better. And then you know, going forward, what to do better. It's not about going back into the past and trying to change the past. It's about taking that wisdom from the reflection and then thinking about how to use it in your future. So you can change your future with your lessons learned from your past. That's what's amazing. But if we live in our past, we fall behind in our future. So it's this idea of reflecting, not judging, reflecting, and then saying, now I know what to do the next time, and then moving into your future with that insight. And Latrice is sharing about having a family member suffer. That's hard to witness suffering and the physical suffering and the emotional suffering is hard. And I think that's when you stay connected to prayer and faith and visualizations. And the other thing is holding hands. What's interesting is there was a, a research study done around women in labor. And the pain eased when they held their partner's hand. So I love this idea that we have this simple free tool that we can use to ease anyone's suffering and it's simply holding hands. If you are in a situation where there's distance and you know that someone's suffering and it's just not possible for you to be there, you can do a visualization where in your mind you are holding their hand. And that's powerful. So it's the physical, but it's also what we visualize. So Mary Beth is also sharing in the chat room, when you reflect on the past and think, what could I have done differently? And you take that reflection and turn it into wisdom. It's also the process of forgiving yourself, because at that time, you did the best. It could have been that in that moment, when you wish you could have done better, you hadn't slept the night before, 
or you had been working a really long 12 hour day, or you had been inundated with problems and you just weren't at your best. The other part about looking back and thinking I should have done differently, we look back and we expect ourselves to have just finished a really healthy meal and have had a good night's sleep and have all the resources available to us and have this moment of abundance where we're generous and, and gracious. And the reality is that is not what it was. So we have to also be realistic when we reflect back. And remember all the minutes leading up to the moment where we think, I wish I would have been better. Because probably those moments leading up are the reason it was hard for you to be better because you just didn't have it. And that's okay. And part of that lesson that you learn is, okay, in order for me to be the best in my moments, I have to give myself a break. I have to make sure that I'm taking care of my good health. And if I'm feeling less, if I'm feeling depleted, I need to say time out. I'll come back to you on that. That's part of our wisdom gained. Yeah, Latrice, I believe this idea of a distance hug is really helpful. So I had a situation in the spring where a friend became really angry with me, but she wouldn't talk to me. So every time I reached out, silence. So I didn't quite understand what it was that made her so angry with me. And when I would wake up in the middle of the night, I would just almost feel like, oh, you could just feel the heart breaking. So I did some research about why we wake up at certain times during the night. And there's a period of time when we wake up, I think it's between three and five, somewhere around there, where if you wake up, it could be because you are grieving. So one of our certified caregiving consultants, Kathy Murray, teaches us how to use movement to take care of our grief. And she talks about giving ourselves a hug. So when I would wake up in the middle of the night at 4 a.m. and just feel my heart breaking, I thought, you know what? I'm going to give myself a hug. And so that's what I would do. And it would calm me down. So giving yourself a hug can help. So part of taking care of your sleep is to do something like give yourself a hug if you're waking up. If the worries are waking you up, know that you are okay. If there's a problem that you haven't been able to solve, sometimes it helps to say before you fall asleep, when I wake up tomorrow, I'll know exactly what next step to take. So this idea that while you are sleeping and resting and recovering from the day, your mind is still working to figure out a solution, a next step. And then when you wake up in the morning, you have a solution. If you wake up because you're worried about if you've done enough, you can tell yourself as you give yourself a hug, I am enough and tomorrow I will be enough for others in my life. And then if you feel like there's an area in your life where you're lacking because you haven't done enough, think about what can you do to be enough? What can you say? What can you do? What can you create? And Mary Beth is sharing some other suggestions in the chat room. And to congratulate yourself for being committed and staying with the process and your loved one, right? I think we oftentimes sell ourselves short. The reality is your full presence with a family member during their difficult time is amazing and that's enough. I think we have this idea that we can change someone else's final destination, meaning we have this idea that death isn't going to come to our family. But the reality is I've never met anyone who has lived forever. So maybe it's this idea that being fully present every day for someone is enough. And that's the gift. And then Mary Beth is also suggesting that you have pen and paper by your bedside. So if you wake up, you can write it down, whatever you're worrying about, whatever you're reflecting on. It's also helpful during your day, rather than thinking I need to do that now, remember, just write down everything that comes to mind about what to do. And then use that as your master list to create your to-do list for today. 
I heard that from a productivity expert, and that's been very helpful for me. If we <laughs> tell ourselves, well, I'll remember, it is putting this burden on ourselves that is unnatural. Instead, if we just write it down, have this master list of everything we want to do, and then use that to create today's to-do list, we are freeing up energy in our mind for other more important tasks. So write it down, write it down. In addition, the movement of pen to paper is really helpful as well. For goal setting, writing down your goals is really helpful. And if anybody else has any other suggestions around how you take care of your sleep, please feel free to share them in the chat room. So just to recap, ask a question before you go to sleep. What will I know tomorrow morning? Or set an intention. When I wake up tomorrow morning, I'll know exactly what my next step will be. So if you wake up, give yourself a hug. Write down a thought on a pad of paper that you keep by your bed. And in addition, think about the rituals that you go through before bed. You could use essential oils. Lavender helps with stress release and sleeping well. You could think about dropping a few essential oils on your pillow. So a few drops of lavender, diffusing some lavender in your room. And then knowing that you've done everything you can today and that you're giving yourself a chance tomorrow. And in order to make the best of that chance tomorrow, you're going to take a good night's sleep because then you'll wake up tomorrow in a better place. So I started thinking about recovery. We're doing a beginning again retreat on Friday for those who are adjusting to life after a family member's death. And I've come up with this idea around a daily healing plan and I'll share a link to it. It's a free resource. You can download this daily healing plan that helps you really think about what's hurting today and then what's my plan to take care of it. And I also started thinking about recovery. When we're coped out, I think we also need to think about how can I recover? So we just went through a series of questions to really think about giving away what isn't ours, lighting, lightening our load, making sure that we're not taking on what isn't ours to take on. And as we lighten our load, we can also make some room for recovery. I started thinking about three steps that we can take to recover. And this is what I came up with. This is a work in progress. So feel free to share any insights or suggestions that you have in the chat room. But I was thinking about our steps to recover include acknowledging the impact. Because sometimes I think we think, I should just power through this. Of course I'm coped out, but I'm gonna power through this. Instead, let's think about what's the impact of coping with so much. It's a way for us to be gracious with ourselves to recognize all that we're managing and that it's hard. It's a moment to step back and look at our life from a few steps away and to see, oh my gosh, look at what's happened just over the past week. No wonder I'm running out of coping. No wonder I'm impatient. No wonder I'm exhausted. It's a way for us to be gentle with ourselves, to acknowledge that there's an impact in our day and in our life with everything that we're coping with. And then thinking about how do we adjust and then how do we heal? Really, we're talking about healing. We're just getting very specific that we're looking at healing when we're coped out. So for you, with all that you're coping with, what's been the impact? It could be that you just reflect on yesterday and what happened yesterday. What's the impact for you today? It could be that you just feel lethargic today because so much happened yesterday. It could be that you just don't have the energy to be as productive as you typically are. And it's because the past week was really tough. 
Or it could be that you think, you know, the past 17 months have been really hard. No wonder I need to take a break. When we acknowledge that there's an impact, it then frees us up to say, oh, I do need time. I do need a break. I do need to take care of myself. So if we understand that there is an impact, then we can make an adjustment. So if yesterday was a really long day and you think, I just don't have it in me today, then you just don't have it in you and you can adjust. So maybe when you go home tonight, you think, I know I should make dinner for everybody, but I just can't. So the adjustment is we're just going to order in. It also could be you think, I've had a really long three days. I'm exhausted. I'm just going to bed early. That's the adjustment. Yes. And in the chat room, an amazing insight, which is to say no. So the adjustment could be that for right now, you just say no to more. So if someone says, I need help with this, you're so great at this, you can say, I'd love to. I'm tapped out right now. Who else could help you with this? So I just had someone connect with me through LinkedIn, and she wanted me to help her with something that I use, but not something that I own. So I'm a user, but I'm not the owner. So I suggested that she go to the owner, because I'm just the user. So I'm not going to be, in essence, the help desk for something I don't own. That was a way for me to say no. I stay in my lane. I created a program that I call the Summer Flashlight Camp. And it's in our community called Caring Our Way. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to share. It's a five course program and it's about finding your purpose in life. And I talk about how I have found it because it felt like there was a moment in time when the universe was share, really flashing this light on my path. And when I put that program together, it made me realize how important it is that I stay on my path and that there's people I meet that I don't have to engage with because they're not right for my path. And for whatever reason, that sounds so basic and simple. <laughs> and I wish I had known that like 25 years ago, but anyway, I figured it out now that it's good for me to stay on my path. And it's also good for me to acknowledge that others have their own path. And sometimes they run parallel, never to touch. And that's a good thing. I don't have to make people be on my path and I don't have to force myself to go on someone else's path. I love this idea that I have my path in life. And it feels like there's so many choices for that when I stay on my path and allow people their own path. And sometimes it's a, watching people stumble and that is okay knowing that your support will help them. But you don't have to stop your path, stop your life and help others all the time. You don't always have to do that. You don't always have to do that. Yeah, and Mary Beth is sharing that we can recognize what is not our issue, right? So we talked about the impact. We know that we're impacted when we have a lot to cope with. And then knowing what's the adjustment when you're tired today because you've coped with so much, what's your adjustment today? that frees you up to give yourself time because you're adjusting. And then what helps you heal? Thinking about what brings you comfort, what helps you connect to your faith, what helps connect you to support, what helps you feel understood. And healing can come through music and prayer and meditation and walking and swimming and anything else that feels like it fills you up, that's healing. And I like this idea that knowing that a lot of coping takes up a lot of our resources, a lot of our reserves, and that puts us in a place of hurting. 
and it's good to give ourselves healing. Yeah, and Mary Beth is sharing that she hangs out with good friends to enjoy laughter because that's so important, right? Healing can come from laughter, from crying, from journaling, from gardening, from just taking a few moments for yourself. Something else that we have coming up next week is a respite in place plan. There are no CEUs for that particular workshop, but if you're interested, please join us. And there is an email that's going out that gives you information about CEUs if you're here for CEUs. And before we close, I'm going to share you with you the link for you to pay the 15 bucks for your CEU so you can complete the evaluation. So this respite in place space is an area in your house or your yard or your neighborhood that you call your own. And I think of it as the place you get a break during a caregiving experience, especially when you can't get a break, but it's also a place you can go to for healing. So it could be a place that you get a break from caregiving, from grieving, and when you are just feeling like, I don't have anything left, I cannot cope. So you go to your respite and place space. Maybe you listen to music, maybe you look at photos, maybe you journal, maybe you just sit. So for me, sometimes I just like to sit. I don't like anything else around me, but just to sit. So when I go to, for instance, swim, I live in an apartment, so I don't have outdoor space. So the pool, the community pool, the outdoor community pool is like my backyard. That's how I look at it. So I swim my laps and then I sit in a lounge chair and that's it. I just sit. <laughs> I make sure to sit where I can look at the trees because nature is healing. So spending time in nature is good for us as well. The pool plays music. I'll listen to the music. I'll look at the trees. I'll pay attention to the sounds of the birds. And that's it. That's what I'll do for about 30 minutes. And then I'll get on with my day. Yeah, Deborah is suggesting too that connecting with an animal, right? That's a way to receive love. That's a way to receive love. It's connecting with an animal. And it could be that it's someone else's cat or dog that you like to go visit. Okay. So something that I think is important to remember, and that is sometimes what happens is we stop believing. So, so much is happening and so much is happening that feels wrong in our life. And we're coping with all these wrong situations or wrong relationships or wrong impacts. And so we stop believing. We think there is nothing right in my world. It all feels so wrong. And really the crisis in faith is what saps our energy more than anything. So I'm just gonna ask you to close your eyes for just about 30 seconds. Get comfortable where you are. If you can, plant your feet firmly on the ground, on the floor, and just follow my voice. We're only gonna do this for about 30 seconds. And that is, I want you to know that the world is right for you. I want you to know that we believe in you. I want you to know that whatever feels wrong right now is short term because you are right in your life, that your life is giving back to you. You may not realize the gift that you're getting right now, and that's okay, but know that you are receiving and know that the universe, God, whatever you believe, believes in you. You are not here in the world without having others, your faith, the universe believe in you. So know when you feel like, oh, I just can't believe anything else could go wrong. Know that we believe you are right in your life. You are enough. You are right. So take a deep breath in and breathe in that we believe in you. And when you have moments of doubt, 
Breathe in that we believe in you. We do. Breathe in that God believes in you. Breathe in that the universe believes in you. Okay, when you're ready, go ahead and open up your eyes. We're just going to finish up because I do believe in you. You are here because you deserve people to believe in you, and we do. So I'm going to stop sharing. Actually, you know what? I'll just let you know if anybody has questions. There is my contact information. There is an email that is going out in just about 10 minutes that does have more information. So if you'd like, you also can reach out to me through that email. And then I just posted in the chat room the link for you to go to if you are here for CEUs. Click the link that says CEUs. You'll pay 15 bucks and then you'll be directed to an evaluation form. If you'd like to download that free healing plan, there's a link for that as well. If you're interested in my book, which takes a closer look in the 12 caregiving fatigues, there's a link to that. And then there's also a link to next month's healing fatigue. And we're going to talk about discouragement fatigue next month. And then in about nine minutes, you'll get another email through Eventbrite from me that has this information as well. And in that, in that email from Eventbrite, I also do include the other upcoming events if you have any interest, including that respite in place plan. Thank you guys so much for coming today. If anyone has a question, feel free to put it in the chat room. Or if you'd like, you can unmute yourself and ask any questions. And I so hope that you know that you can you can keep coping because you already have. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm gonna stop the recording.